Ever wonder why artists create their art? In this series, Crafting a Career in the Arts, The Art of Why, you will hear from Edmonton-based artists from a wide range of disciplines. These artists will share with you why they create, how they use their art form to maintain their mental health, help with a disability, or as a way to connect with their community. We will also feature some of Edmonton's locations and organizations that support the arts in our city. In this episode, you will hear from Edmonton-based artist, storyteller, and dancer Blake on why he dances, tells stories, and creates. Tansay, my name is Blake Desjardins, and I am from Edmonton, Alberta. I am a storyteller, an oral artist, and a dancer, and that's really guided the work that I really wanted to pursue, which is making sure that we can change the world for the better. And I'm proud to say that today I'm elected member of our House of Commons in Canada. And I can't really remember the first time I started dancing. Maybe as soon as I started to be able to walk. I know I I do remember when I first was formally taught. You know, of course, children in where I come from, uh, where I was born, or where I was raised, was the Fishing Lake Métis Settlement, a place where everyone danced, a place where everyone can participate in this beautiful piece of art. And so I learned it as a way to communicate as a small child uh, with other people, to see that they were like me and I was like them. And later on, I became a master at perfecting the art. I helped to rebirth the Red River Jig, not just in my nation, but right across our province. And it's something that I I uh, hope we'll be continue to do for a very, very long time. So the Red River Jig is a timeless dance. It's been something that's been passed on for generation after generation after generation from dancers. Whether they were Cree, Scottish, French or Irish, we have gifts that have been melded together in an art form that my grandparents, my Cookham and Musham, my Chapan, that they held very close to their heart. And so it's a dance that's been performed for centuries. When we ask what is art, I think it's similar to the question of who we are. And when we ask that question of who we are, it's important to know that not just those stories that we hear of our grandparents and generations that have passed on are important to answering that question, but where that art lives today because it doesn't pass away like humans. I believe like so many indigenous people that our art forms live they live amongst us. They're in the room right now as we speak and they're in the very same places that the viewers are listening from. They're in the room and these spirits can communicate and they can offer things to us. And the most important thing they can offer us is who we are and show us where we are. And so when I think about what art means to me, I think about the journey that art has taken and what it's seen and what it has yet to teach us. And so I think its value and its purpose is so deeply connected to this place, to land, to water, but to the spiritual realm and to each and every one of us. It connects us. I really believe that art is a form of power, a kind of spirit that could be fought, it could be pushed away, it could be neglected even. It could be pushed so far outside of viewing eyes or listening ears that no one ever hears it, but it's still alive. And so. What it means to me and what it means about myself is making sure that we can welcome that spirit back into this place, welcome that spirit back into our lives and see that it has tremendous things to offer us. It can heal us. The Métis people have a tremendous lexicon of memory from the times that we gathered together at those original moments in history along the Red River, along the North Saskatchewan, along the Athabasca, and along the Peace. We've traveled many rivers, and as long as those rivers span this great country, our stories are built within them, in the things we've seen as a people. The stories that are most special to me are the tales of a great trickster spirit, a trickster spirit we call Wasake Chuck. And one of the t stories that Wasake Chuck shares of the Métis people that is one that is most valuable to me, 
is a story of suffering and kindness. Osake Chuck is a spirit that, like humans, has a conscience and learns through its mistakes and is also a shapeshifter. Wasake Chuck has the ability to learn from other animals and through that lesson and learning and observation, be like them. And that's something that humans, I think, could really benefit from, learning how we can live in peace with one another. And Wasake Chuck teaches us those lessons. And the duck dance, special Métis dance, the Red River, part of the Red River Jig, comes out of this story of the ducks sacrificing themselves in order for Wasake Chuck to feed the Métis people. And it's a remarkable tale of sacrifice that the spirits, the ducks, give themselves up so that the Métis people can, may, may continue in this place, continue to be here. And in that sacrifice, we honor them and we dance for them. Well, I'd say the most common way to dance the Red River Jig or the most common setting to dance the Red River Jig or the most common place for people like me to do that is in community. It's meant to invite people in, to help tell the story of who we are, and to show them that we've traveled a long way. But it's also, for the Métis people, a, me a message of pride and a message that we're still here. And so when I think about where we do it, it's where community lives. Whether that's in a bingo hall sometimes where I've performed, or all the way to places like the retirement of premiers and prime ministers, it's everywhere in between, where the community is. There is a special season though, I do want to mention. For winter time is a really special time for indigenous people right across Turtle Island because it signifies a time of rest. It's the only time we're actually able to tell our stories is when there's snow on the ground. When there's snow on the ground, people gather. Oftentimes they're on fires. And that's where that, that, that setting comes from, is making sure you can welcome people into warmth, welcome them into comfort, and welcome them into learning. So that's the origin of our storytelling and our dance. We're around fires in wintertime. Today we do it where community lives, where that fire lives today, where community can build that fire. And it might not mean a fire that we build with stick and ember, but it could be the fire that we build together through contribution of our willingness to learn and our willingness to be part of a community. That's the kind of fire that needs stoking today now more than ever. And I think that our stories, our dance, and our art can do that. There's times in my life where our stories and our dance have had important and critical pathways to understanding who I am. And one of them was when I was young. My cookum, her name was Christina, a remarkable woman, someone who survived so much. And one of the things that she was able to keep with her was a small dance she did underneath the tables of a residential school. She was apprehended from her community and taken to residential school at a young age where she lived most of her life. And in that place, she was told her parents were savage, that their art wasn't worth anything, that she wasn't worth anything. How she handled that as a small child is unbelievable to be told that. But what she did was never forget. One of the greatest things my grandmother could ever do was to never forget. Because if she were to forget who she was, we, me, all of us, would be severed from a history, severed from our past and severed from our ancestors. And for her, she could never tell that story. She was never able to tell the story of how awful those places were to her. She would often freeze up, be still, and be quiet. But there was a one cure, and it was this dance the small dance that me and the other children took for granted. We learned it, we seen it so much growing up that we thought it was just second nature to everyone. But when we see those old people, our elders, and how happy they got, we would never see them smile. We would never see them clap the, the way they did until the song came on, that violent fiddle started and the stomping was happening. Then their spirits would be alive, then they would awaken. And you can see my grandmother in those moments. It's how she communicated with me. It's how many grandparents in Métis communities communicated with their children. Without the language to describe how awful their experience was, an experience they thought was normal amongst our generation. The pain, the abuse, they found that 
their children were never their children would never have that taken from them. And they knew that because they'd seen us dance. They'd communi we would communicate with them. We would tell them we're still here. Just simply by the dance we were doing, it saved lives. Our dance saved lives. She would often dance below her own table. She herself, a great dancer, but in her old age, unable to move a lot. But during her final years in my life, I would always remember her asking us if we could dance and she would move her feet just so slightly as what strength she had in order to dance with us. Because she knew if she danced with us, we would remember how important it was and we remember who we were. And that's a way that it's helped so many families across the Métis world, including my own. It's been a moment where, in a world where so many things divided me and my grandmother, a world that wanted to take her from me, she danced back. My favorite part of the Red River Jig is the change, the first change. When you see the jig turn into this new move, that first move was a gift from my first Red River Jig teacher, my cook'em. My cook'em who went to residential school, whose only memory of that dance lived in her at that place. And she was strong enough and survived long enough to pass that on. So I always start with the dance, recognizing that. And it's how I touch base with her. I think this dance would be helpful for others, particularly those who feel disconnected, feel forgotten, or feel left behind. So many Métis people right now are reconnecting, trying to remember who they are. And I always say, you won't find that in a book. 
and you won't find that at school. You're going to find that in our art. Lou Riel himself said, my people will sleep for 100 years, and it'll be the artist who awakens them. And that's today. I'd like people to know that this dance has been banned in Canada. It was something we had to fight to preserve, something that everyday people had to make sure wasn't taken away. And throughout that survival, a story of resilience, a story of strength, and a story of pride now lives in it. And I'm so proud to carry that tradition, that dance, and I want others to do the same. If anyone's interested in learning how to do the Red River Jig or dances like it, you can always stop by the Métis Nation of Alberta website. They're always hosting a bunch of awesome events. If you have a chance, you can also visit one of Alberta's Métis settlements, where I'm from. There's teachers in every single one of them, but right here in our great city of Edmonton, you can also visit the Native Friendship Centers, who host class every single year, and I'm hoping one day I can help them out and be a teacher. Performing the Red River Jig, or even telling our stories, and being part of the artistic community that, is with, that lives within the Métis is a very powerful and humbling experience. And it's one that I feel connects us both into the past, but also to the future. And there's been many times, not just in my life, but I'm sure in many Indigenous people's live, lives that we felt less than, neglected, whether that's from racism or poverty or the status of where you live. And so many folks have told us that we cannot be ourselves. We're not allowed to be ourselves. And being able to do the Red River Jig is not only an act of resistance to that, but it's an act of preservation. And if you're someone who may suffer from mental health, in particular self-esteem issues, Knowing who you are and where you come from and understanding how proud one can be by knowing and figuring out how to connect with those great stories and those great people and those legends is a way of building pride in oneself. The way that I imagine the dance when not dancing is an exercise of helping my mind move it throughout this world. I, and many others, I believe, especially in the digital era, suffer from rumination. This idea that something is wrong. And in many ways, there are many things wrong. But there's never been more things wrong than there were before. Our world has always been imperfect. Humans have always been imperfect. And what reminds me of that is the dance, the Red River Jig. Right in its name, it fills me with happiness. A river. Imagine that. Water. And there's water even present with us right now. And that water is a reminder of strength. And the Red River Jig is from the water. It's where my people are from. And when we talk about rivers, we talk about movement and we talk about life. And what it means for me in the daily life, 21st century as a member of parliament, when things can move so fast and they can seem unmovable, I think of water. I think water finds a way, just like the dance, to do what it needs to do. It gets to that place, and sometimes it always keeps flowing. And that's helped me so much in my life from not being stuck, reminding myself that the rivers always move, the river will always continue in its journey, and the river has strength because of it. We just have to keep moving. And the River Jig reminds me, in a world where mountains and doors seem immovable, that we're water. And like the river and like the dance, we'll just keep going. And that helps because some days it's really hard just to get up for a lot of folks, me included. The dance reminds me we've got to keep moving and that we're still here. The dance is a gift of two nations, the Red River Jig. Our European fathers gifted us with the ability to find rhythm in strings, the violin, the fiddle. Our Cree grandmothers gave us the way to connect to the land, the motions to plant ourselves firmly here so that we may grow. So how it connects us, how my art form connects to the land is it's a direct product of the land. The, land, the dance would not exist if not 
for the land's will to gift us something so precious, a way of communicating with others, but also to reconnect ourselves with the land. The dance from our Cree grandmothers was a gift of the grass dance. And for any Cree folks who know about the grass dance, it's a dance that was traditionally used to clear the way to, in a field, to make way for a village, so the village may be erected in that spot. And these were people who went and moved all of this grass out of the way with their legs, and they used motions to connect with the land to do it. So they would use their legs and they would sweep, collecting grass amongst their calf, placing it down to the ground, softening it so that we may connect with it. Creating a bed on the earth so that we may sleep on it. Imagine that tradition combined with rhythm, adding rhythm to that. Imagine how many villages we can make with that. And that's what the Veti did. We connect every single day because of that dance. It reminds us that we are part of the earth, that we have a responsibility to build communities on this earth, and that we have to do that in a really good way. We have to do it in a way that respects Mother Earth because she's given us so much. Art can unite, and if we can unis unify that or use it as a tool to ensure that our world grows together rather than apart, is worthwhile for me in my role. Constituents, regular neighbors, have shown me their art and shown me a piece of themselves. And it makes me do my job much better. Because not, not always can someone share how they're feeling in a sentence, even in a letter. But art is a way that we can connect in a way where an MP, city councillor, your parents, your children could understand you better. And I think anyone who takes up the charge to listen to that voice, that spirit of art, they'll find that. I grew up in a place called the Fishing Lake Métis Settlement. Remarkable poverty, but remarkable people. We had so much with no money. We had a community that would share. Even though we had no idea where this stuff was coming from, it was shared. And it, was uni it united us because we were the same people. But we wouldn't have figured that out without the stories, without the dance, without the Red River Jig. So me, when I perform the Red River Jig, it shows others that I'm Métis and that I'm proud to be Métis. And that helps me to exist in this world, to know that I am enough. I am enough and I'm allowed to survive. I'm allowed to be me and I'm allowed to be here. And it reminds me every single day how proud I am for the people who've sacrificed so much that I'm here. Because I would not be here without people who were able to perform this dance. That's what we have in common. They were able to do this dance too. And they fought for it and they gave their lives for it, just so that I could do it today. That connects me with pride, and that connects me with my sense of well-being and wholeness, because without it, I'd be lost. We see that today. Indigenous people from coast to coast to coast who've been ripped from their homes, ripped from their language, ripped from their culture, ripped from their dance. But it's time to make sure we start teaching the dance and teaching others, particularly the Indigenous folks. It's, we should be proud to be yourselves. We should be proud for who we are. And these dances are our medicine. They will heal us. Well, the Red River Jig has given me a lot of gifts. And one of the gifts it's given me, especially being young, was the ability to connect with others in a way that I would have never otherwise learned how to. As a little boy, when I first remember dancing in front of a crowd of people, these are people that I'd otherwise never have met in my community. People would come up, they'd be interested, they'd see it and they'd say, you know Blake, I want to share a story with you. My grandma taught me the exact same dance. I can't believe I hadn't heard that story, I seen that dance in so long. Thank you for sharing that with me. My whole life doing this dance, at least one person at the end of it has always come up to me and thanked me because they've missed it. They've lost it somewhere along the line, and they didn't know how to do it. And when I show them how to do it, they're reminded, they're teleported to a place where they're safe, where they remember their loved ones, where they remember that music, they remember that dance. Because the song is the story. We are the performers of that story. We are the performers of that song. And the Red River Jig is composed of two separate dances. 
because the song is two separate songs put together. The Red River Jig has what's called the reel. Throughout the song though, there's cue changes. The song will flip. And as someone who's ear trained, part of what I did for young people, helping to revitalize the dance, was to help ear train children to listen to that song because the dance changes so rapidly. It goes into what's called the change. The change step are, is a step of uniqueness and flair and art. That's where you can really be an artist in the Red River Jig. The standard steps are all shared amongst people like my cookum, my mushum, and ancestors for a long time. But what divides us and what makes us unique is the change steps. So when the fiddle changes song right in the middle, there's the change step. That's where creativity explodes. And the side step is one that my grandmother gifted me. And it's one I cherish a lot because it's the only one she could remember. And to know that her father and her grandma, the people she was taken away from, only in her memories can she remember them doing this dance. I get to do that dance too. The presence I feel when doing the Red River Jig is something that translates directly to my work, directly to connecting with people, which I feel is my number one job, making sure I connect with folks, understand where they're coming from, and are able to listen to the concerns that they feel are most important to them. It's a process that, like the Red River Jig, returns them to a place, sometimes for the worse, and something that we should prevent, but that are also reminded of what should be a better. And like the dance, it has those reminders. It has those cues for when you're doing the jig and for when you're doing the change. There's a moment between there where you need to make a decision. And I think what I do in my work are consistently that moment between changing from one step to another. There's a moment between there where good things can happen. And I want to find ways I could do that, not just in the jig, where a new step can be invented right from that moment, which can live on forever, but connecting with individuals, because I know when I connect with them once, that relationship could truly be a long one and can help change this world. It can help change people, because that's what happened to me. I'm just a bush kid, and some remarkable pe people have helped me along the way, and I want to be able to give that back. And I know that the dance is one way that I, throughout my life, have been able to remind myself of that important mission, to connect people to what their changes are. I would hope that people in 100 years, when they see the Red River Jig, would have a smile on their face and it would be filled with movement. It's like an infection in some ways. The dance and the song force you to move, force you to clap along, and force you to stomp your feet. And humans for the last 200 years haven't changed that way. We've been doing this dance a long time. And the last 100 years this dance was first, was first danced, people who had never seen it before, people from Europe, people who were first in Turtle Island, when they witnessed it, they joined in. They asked, how do I do that dance? The next 100 years, I hope they ask the same thing. I hope people, when they see it, will ask, how do I do that? And how do I dance? The Matard Conservatory features more than 700 species of plants in three climate-regulated biomes alongside a feature biome with seasonal displays, a public garden, and three greenhouses. The Matard provides inspiration to artists across many disciplines. The artwork from renowned Canadian artist Alex Janvier, featured in the Matard, had a profound impact on Blake as a child and serves as an inspiration in the public work he does and the art he creates. Mm -hmm. 